Okay, so your Jimmo, greetings yet I say. We thank you once again for joining again with us. Uh, for those who are unaware, I am Ojirafo Kwesi Rodney Hamata Akan. Ojirafo of Akwamu Mine, Amaruka, Tifimu, that is the Akwamu Nation in North America within Ojira Mine, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurite, Kaitni people, African black people in the Western Hemisphere. So tonight we want to address a topic. We're not going to go as long as um, we did the previous couple of hours on um, the previous session, but we want to talk about this divinity, Ren Pet, and we want to talk about this notion of renewal and how that affects our lives and cosmologically as well as on a mundane level. We deal with renewal, rejuvenation, purification. We went through the spring and summer cycle and so forth, and we're in the midst of that. This is a female divinity that governs that renewal process. Everything that we have to deal with regard to growth, renewal, purification, uh, repair, and so forth, so we can function harmoniously in the world. Ren Pet is related to that and governs a significant aspect of that. So she's a specific force in creation, and we want to get into it. So let me expand this out right quick. So uh, you see it says Ren Pet. Chaut. Renpet is the term for year in ancient Canadian Kemet. So uh, Renpet means year. Chaut is the term for 20. So this, uh, these symbols here, the palm frond, uh, the long stalk and so forth, the little T symbol, the loaf of bread, and the solar disc, that is the term for Renpet. So on a mundane level, Renpet means year. Uh, Chaut is the term for 20, but Ren Pet or the year has to do with renewal or return and so forth, because that's what happens every year, of course, is a return. So the name year is named after the female divinity Ren Pet. There's also a male divinity, Ren Pu. We're going to focus on Ren Pet tonight. This is the image of the female divinity Ren Pet. So Second. Okay, so I want to take you into some information. Hold on one second. Let me pull up this. Uh, to give you some proper definitions. Okay, so we're going to expand this out. Um, this is an image in the temple of Seti in Abju of the female divinities Ma'at and Renpet together. Expand this so you can see it better. So this is Ma'at and Renpet together standing before the divinity al -Sar. You see Ma'at here with the, with the feather, sacred feather of Ma'at. But you also see Ren Pet with her sacred palm frond as a headdress as well. And they deal with renewal, al -Sar transitions, dies and resurrects. He governs that entire renewal process the spiritual force in creation that causes the shoots to burst through the surface of the soil so that new life can manifest once again and budding can take place and so forth. That force is Ren Pet. And this is her right here. Of course, she's coupled with Ma'at because this manifests in balance. She also has to do with the new year, renewal, spring also when things begin to renew. So Ma'at, the male, female force of divine balance, Ma'a is the male force of divine balance, and they govern the equinoxes as far as the balancing points of the year. So when we talk about the spring and so forth and the shoots popping up, Ma'at, that balancing point of the year, 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of darkness, that's a balancing point 
the equinox, equal nights, and so forth. That's a balancing point. Actually, the second balancing point of the year, that is the time of Ma'at and so forth. So she governs that balancing point. And it's from that region that the that that region in time of that cycle in time that Rin Pet governs the shoots. She forces through her energetic force the shoots to pop through and burst through the surface of the soil to bring that renewal back once again. So So this is a close-up image of her. And the palm frond is very important. So Ren Pet, Ren Pet, and so forth. Once again, you see the palm frond. Different names, different ways of spelling the name. And they'll say she's the year goddess, the beginning of the year, and so forth. Now. Going to look at some variations of the, the word ren pet, ren pet, and so forth to get a better understanding. So, when you look at the basic mundane uh, definitions of the term, you get some greater insight. Okay, so the related term, rain P, to become young, to be young, to grow. You'll even see the little uh, image of the small child and so forth. Rain P, a spring plant or a flower, rain put, fruit. Vegetables, young trees. Then, of course, rain pet or rain peat. In the Coptic dialect, is rom pe. Um, the term for year. And it's the term for year because it's pointing to a specific cycle. So when you see rain peat or rain pet and so forth, it's pointing to a specific cycle. The solar disk, the, the circle with the dot in the middle, represents the solar disk, the sun and so forth, and then you have the sprouts. So it's pointing to that cycle in the solar year where the sprouts arise and the energy is different in the land. So that's why it references year. Now, then you also have rep, rin pet tep, meaning the top or the tep of the year. That's New Year's Day, festival of the New Year's Day, different variations of that. You have the festival of the great year and so forth, Ren Pet, with the little symbol for the festival symbol and so forth. The male divinity is Rain Pu, the year god, and Rain Pet, the year goddess and so forth, also Ren Pet. So you see these different uh, meanings, but young shoots, vegetables, sprouting, renewal, and so forth. Now, let me show you, I'm gonna take you to a video right quick. I wanna show you um, that specific temple in Abju and where we got that, that actual image is an image that I took myself when I was visiting the temple of Seti in Abju, in so-called Abydos. Want to show you that real quick. Just to show we have this primary evidence. So when we, we talk about these things and we talk about the divinities and the texts and so forth, we want primary sources where we go to the actual source and get this information for ourselves. The same is true when we talk about these forces in creation and spirituality. We deal with them directly through ritual, through spirit possession, spirit communication. So we have direct primary access as opposed to simply repeating what other people are saying or what other people have said. So let me switch over real quick. 
So when we were in the temple of Seti and Abju, this is where that image of Ma'at and Renpet before Asar comes from. So that's so-called Abidos, is Abju. That is the deity Pata, the Okwade and Akan. That is a form of Alsar, Spool, Regalia. That is a form of our set and the full regalia uh, plumes coming from the crown and so forth, the solar disc, the vulture headdress and so forth, showing her as the queen mother. That's all star and all set together. All of these reliefs are on the walls of the Temple of Seti, which is one of the most well-preserved temples. This is Tuhuti, the divinity of divine wisdom on the masculine side. Holding a staff, this is where they stole Moses with the staff and swallowing the serpents and so forth. That is Heru, son of Osar and Oset. And then you have these great pillars inside of the temple and on the walls in the relief. This is where we, the image of Ma'at and Renpet, where we capture that image from. There are many different chambers within the temple dedicated to different divinities and released for these different divinities in these various chambers. Very a huge temple. All right. Okay, so we just wanted to show you that. Now let's switch over to a different text. We want to look at the Meru text, the pyramid text. The Meru text or so-called pyramid text are the oldest religious compositions, as we said, yet unearthed in the world. So you won't find any religious compositions older than the pyramid text. Now there are other, you know, inscriptions in ancient Kanita Gamet that are older than the pyramid texts, like different invoices and names of divinities and different things like that. But as far as religious compositions, laying out the cosmology of the culture, the oldest ones, not only in Kemet, but also anywhere in the world are the pyramid texts. It goes back over 4,400 years ago. Now, so when we go all the way back to the Meru text, the pyramid text, the term Meru is pyramids and so forth, plural. Let's look at what we have. This particular text, hold on one second. I missed my place, all right. Okay, this particular text is uh, uh, was written for the Pera, so-called Pharaoh, Pepi. So it references Pepi, who has transitioned his spirit, his ancestor, and so forth, and moving through the ancestral realm. And this is what they have to say. So Pepi has come to you. Uh, it says, "O Lord," but the the title is Neb meaning Lord or Master, Neb of heaven or the heavenly realm, Pepe has come to you, Osar. This Pepe has cleansed his, your face. He has arrayed you in the apparel of the divinity. He has purified you in Chedat, the star Sapatit, so-called Sothis or Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, your beloved daughter who make, makes your annual offerings to you and the annual offerings. We saw the fruits, the young trees, the vegetables and so forth, the Renpu, in her name of Renpet. 
She is the guide of this peppy when he comes unto you. This peppy comes to you, or, O oh Lord, a master of heaven, ne ne pet. This peppy comes to you, O oh Asar. This peppy has cleansed thy face. He has arrayed you in the apparel of the divinity. He has purified you in Ata. He has devoured the flesh of your enemies, like that lion who kills the enemies. He has destroyed them, Asar, and he has placed them at the head of the Henti divinities. This peppy has come to you, O Neb Pet, Master Lord of Heaven. This peppy has come to you, Asar. This peppy has cleansed your face. As a raid you in the apparel of the divinity, he has done for you what Geb, the father of Asar, commanded him to do for you. He's established your hand on life. He has lifted up your hand with serenity. This peppy has come to you, O Lord of Heaven. This peppy has come to you, O Asar. This peppy has cleansed your face. He has arrayed you in the apparel of the divinity. He has purified you. Behold, Heru, your son, whom you have brought forth, has not put this peppy at the head of the deceased, but he has set him among the deities who are divine. So, but the key point here is he makes the person uh, annual offerings to the divinities and so forth in her name of Ren Pet. She is the guide of this Pepe when he comes to you, comes to Asar. So Asar is the divinity that dies and resurrects and so forth. He deals with renewal and return, the return of an ancestral spirit back into the world, the return of the crops when they die and resurrect and so forth. They you know, lose all their color and die, but then the green shoots pop up and they return and so forth. So Asar governs the return, governs the renewal, and Ren Pet leads Pepe to Alsar, and um, Ren Pet is the one who guides that renewal. She also guides the individual to the divinity that governs renewal, guides the individual to her, you know, her function in the world, which is that force that causes the shoots to prop up. Yeah. Now let's look at a. I'm going to look at one of our documents. One of our books. Hold on one second. So one of the books that we published, and today we have I've published 31 books. Um, you can download all 31 books for free on our website. One of them that we're going to look at a portion of tonight is the journal that we release. We have a conference every year. We have three conferences every year, but in June, around the summer solstice, we have the Ojiramain Afashe, the Ojiramain Conference. We deal with Amain Sesu, nation building and restoration, a nationism conference. Nationism is the purification of nationalism. It's nation building, restoration rooted in our ancestral religious values. So we talk about the seven principal values of nation building and restoration, methods of food production and preservation, methods of curing disease, um, establishing a military structure, establishing training, cultural, religious, educational institutions, establishing sound systems of governance and jurisprudence, the manufacturing of clothing, um, the acquisition of land and so forth. So these various seven principal values of nation building restoration is what we deal with and we are you know engaged in these different aspects of nation build building as an oman as a nation as an afurakani afurakani purified oman the term ojiramain as you'll see in this document literally means the purified ojira oman nation so when we introduce Ojiraman, that simply means the purified nation. That references Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people in the Western hemisphere. African people, wherever we exist in the world, we're all part of the same great divine body. We live in different parts of the earth mother's body. We have a unique expression of Afurakani, Afurakani culture, 
since we migrated to a certain region of the Earth Mother's body, whether we migrated deliberately, intentionally, or if we were forced to migrate, like in the Musuo Kesie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era, we were forced to migrate to the Western Hemisphere. However, once we came to the Western Hemisphere, we freed ourselves from enslavement. Thousands of our people escaped and waged war against the whites in their offspring, established independent sovereign states and so forth, waged war and forced the end of enslavement. But we began to interface with this region of the Earth Mother's body. That includes the plant life, animal life, mineral life in this region of the Earth Mother's body. We incorporated that, consumed the plant life, animal life, mineral life, food as well as medicine and so forth. We also blended ancestral blood circles and interface with the unique expression of the forces in nature, the abosom, orisha, vodou, and so forth, as they manifest in this region of the Earth Mother's body. So the same force that possess a river on the continent, that same force animates the river in this region of the Earth Mother's body. However, we're in a different region of her body, so the expression is different. The expression of the divinities that govern fertile land, mountains, the atmosphere, solar energy, lunar, and so forth. It's a unique expression as it manifests in this region of the Earth Mother's body. We get possessed by these forces in creation and so forth. We deal with the plant life, animal life, mineral life in this region of the Earth Mother's body. We blend ancestral blood circles. And therefore, through that process, we forged a unique expression of Afurakani, Afurakani culture, African Black culture in this region. So our unique expression is Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. And for us here in North America and so forth, we have a locative identity, a unique expression of Afurakani, Afurakani culture rooted in our blending of ancestral blood circles since we've been here and our interfacing with the plant life, animal life, mineral life in this region of the Earth Mother's body, as well as the unique expression of the divinities as they manifest in this region of the Earth Mother's body. We've also had our ancestresses and ancestors who have been buried in this region of the Earth Mother's body. So therefore, this region is now sacred to us on a different level. The Earth Mother's body is sacred, period. But there's a unique sacredness when our the bodies of our ancestresses and ancestors are in this soil, that it makes it especially sacred for our recent generations. So, Ojira Main, the purified Ojira Omain nation, is the nation of Afurakani, Afurakani people, African Black people in the Western Hemisphere. But we have purified our culture. And now that we've purified our culture, ancestral religious practices, and so forth, then we move forward to build a nation rooted in our ancestral religious values, not, not secular nationalism, not rooted in the fake religions of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and so forth, or pseudo-esotericism, or you know, pseudo-political ideologies by the white scenario spring like Marxism or socialism. We don't embrace their false ideologies and foolish false pseudo-religious practices as a basis for nation building or nationalism. We deal with Amaniye, which is nationism, the purification of nationalism. So this is what this conference is about. And we published a journal for the first three years of the conference. Um, this was uh, part one, the first one, free download. You can get that from our website. And there's a section in here we want to get to in this journal, different articles talking about different, you know, aspects of nation building. One of the articles we put forth, we're examining the cosmogram that we call the Per Ankh Nut. Different Afurakani, Afurakani people use this similar cosmogram, the different movements of the sun, the cycle of life, not just the day cycle, but the year cycle, but also every cycle within life can be captured within this, uh, this cosmogram and so forth. Various cultures on the continent have this, and we brought that into the Western Hemisphere with us. So we examine this cosmogram and how it impacts our everyday lives and how we can govern ourselves by it. First, we get into etymological roots of the term and so forth to show that this same symbol can be found 
in ancient Kanid and Kemet. Here, for example, you have the great god Amen, the great father. You have the great goddess Amenet, the great mother, and so forth, who together comprise the supreme being. Uh, but we go into some etymological roots to show, you know, that this symbol, this is, again, Amenet and Amen, again, the supreme being, and so forth. But now we show, show the same nude symbol you find in ancient Kanid and Kemet. You find amongst the Bakongo people, the Dikenga Dia Congo, which is their cosmogram, their expression of this cosmogram. Same symbol you find in ancient Kemet. We were just proving that in this section. Then we show that same symbol within the Akan people of Ivory Coast and Ghana, the Adinkra symbols, we find the same symbolism. The Oheni Krakon Wadie and so forth, dealing with the soul governing. We have, we have the same symbol, we're just proving that. Then we show the Oponifa, the divination tray in the Yoruba tradition. They often divide that tray into quadrants when they're engaged in divinatory practices. And within that circle or cycle is everything that can take place within creation and so forth. So they also have a version of the same symbolism. We're showing this a cross-cultural symbol. And then the original symbol, the circular zodiac of Dendera from ancient Kemet. So when you go to the temple of Het Heru, in Dendera, in Southern Kemet, and we've been to that temple and so forth, you'll see that circular zodiac. This is the original circular structure from which these ancient symbols are taken. This is a drawing of that, the various symbols representing the different constellations in the sky and so forth. Now, so then we show a comparison. The Newt symbol from Kemet, the Bakongo symbol, the Akan symbols, the Yoruba symbol, and the circular zodiac symbol from ancient Kemet. Showing us the same structure, we maintained it across cultures. Now, once we understand that, then we talk about the progression of life and how these things, how our cycles of life, inclusive of this, renewal cycle, and how in order for us to function harmoniously in the world, as well as repair ourselves physically and spiritually, we need to understand how we get to that renewal, renewal point and move through that renewal point so we can purify ourselves, move forward, and execute our function in the world. If we run into uh, obstacles or make mistakes and so forth, we have the ritual process that we can engage in to get back to that renewal point so we can smooth our lives out and continue to function. So the progression of life. Sun rises in the eastern horizon at the dawn of a new day, it climbs to its zenith, manifesting the peak of its power. The sun sets below that western horizon, descending into the quote unquote underworld. The sun is eventually reborn once again above the eastern horizon. So these different cycles of the sun also govern the behavioral cycle. So we have this section called Uben, awareness and the behavioral cycle. And here's this notion of every behavior you engage in follows the cycle of the seeding, germinating, rooting, sprouting, flowering, harvesting, and reseeding cycle of plant life. Every behavior that you've ever engaged in follows that cycle and we can map that cycle. And there are different phases of that cycle. So when you run into problems, you can determine what phase of the cycle you're in and correct yourself in that phase so you can move forward harmoniously. Now, let's look at the cycle. Of course, this is the image. Of course, that's the seeding and germination, rooting, sprouting, flowering and so forth and eventually you harvest but we say for the progression of life after a seed is planted or is embedded within earth the seed germinates hold on a second 
and the roots reach downward. There's a co-mingling of the seeds roots with the nutrients and water within the soil. The next major stage of development is the upward push above the surface of the soil. The new sprouts show themselves to the world and to the sun. The next major stage of development is the full flowering of the plant and the maturation of its fruit. The next stage of, is of the harvesting of the fruit or the detachment of the fruit and the leaves of the plant. As the fruit and the plant's leaves return to earth, new seeds eventually embed themselves within earth and the life cycle repeats itself. So that is the cycle. When we talk about the new shoots, remember rain pea, new shoots and so forth, new plants sprouting, new year, renewal, rain pea. She's the force within earth that causes the sprouting to happen. Without that force, you're not going to have germination and you're not gonna have um, rooting and the grabbing of the nutrients and water and so forth. You just drop the seed in the soil and nothing happens. But when Ren Pit, Ren Pet's energy or Ren Pit or Ren Pet's energy is operant and so forth, then the germination happens, the movement happens, the rooting happens, um, the sprouting happens and so forth. Now, just like she does that for the plants, she does that with regard to our energy within our spirit body. She also does that with our behavior. So let's look at that. We function with, in harmony with this life progression in all aspects of our lives and so forth. So we break this up into the top portion is the physical world we call Tawi. The bottom hemisphere is the underworld, which is the duat and so forth. And then we have the dividing points of Ma'an, Ma'at. Now let's look at it. Each one of the phases of the movements of the sun and so forth is also a phase of the behavioral cycle. And we have them color coded here. And we also have them color coded here. But let's look at the color coded portion first. If you look at the yellow portion, that's sunrise. Of course, the red portion is the sun at its hottest point in the day, noon and so forth. The white portion is the sun getting older, white and so forth, sunset, graying and so forth, the evening point, and then the sun going into the underworld at midnight, the dark point and so forth, the black sun. So that is the cycle. But you also have the yellow point that is the spring equinox, 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of darkness. It is the equal nights or equinox, 12 hours and 12 hours, the balancing point. It's actually the second balancing point of the year. That's the yellow phase. The sun at the highest point, we just crossed that June 20th, June 21st. Equinox is March 20th. Uh, June 20th, 21st, the summer solstice is the hottest time of the year, the longest day of the year, 15 hours of sunlight, nine hours of darkness. That's the red, fiery summer solstice. First day of summer and so forth, that's what we have. Then the sun set, just like the sun set in the evening, the evening of the year is the autumn equinox, September 22nd, September 23rd. That's like the sun set. Autumn equinox, 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of darkness. Equinox or equal nights, that's the balancing point. That is actually the first balancing point. Spring is the second balancing point. Some people say, well, spring is the beginning of the year, so that should be the first balancing point. When the sun sets in the evening and you see the sun set and looks like it's going into the underworld, that is akin to a seed being planted in the ground. Now, so the seeds plant in the ground and the seed goes into the quote unquote underworld. You take a seed, you plant it in the ground. You bury it, cover it over with soil and you water it. That's actually a funerary ceremony. You bury the seed and then you leave. Just like all Sar was dies and he's buried in the ground and so forth, but then he has the potential for resurrection. 
So you bury the seed, sun sets, it penetrates the earth. The uh, autumn equinox, that's when the sun is setting in September 22nd, 23rd. We consider that the conception point. Uh, six months later at the spring, when the sprouts happen, that is the birth. But the conception happens when the seed enters the ground. That is the conception point. Seed is buried. Then germination happens and the roots go down deep into the soil, deep into the blackness, the darkness and so forth. And when they go deep in the darkness, that's the quote unquote black sun to reach deep down nutrients of the soil and the water and so forth. Once they re reach deep down to grab what they need, then they're empowered to the surface of the soil. That is the spring equinox. That is the sprouting, that is the birth. Conception happens first, birth happens at the spring equinox. Conception is in September 22nd, and this is why in our Khan tradition, the New Year's Day is the autumn equinox. That's the conception time. It's the end of the warm cycle. It's the beginning of the seeding cycle. So you seed at that time, and then the sprouts come later. The sprouts are just a manifestation of what was happening in the underworld and the unseen when people didn't know what was going on. So the seeding happens here and that's the beginning of the cycle. So so contact happens when the seed is embedded. And we show the image of the seed, that's the first part of the cycle. When we come in contact with an entity, engage an issue, or hear a dilemma, witness an act, or an event, this contact, engagement, hearing, witnessing is akin to the planting or embedding of a seed into us, I say, a fool, the earth mother. The unfolding of our behavior begins with our perceiving the entity, deed, issue, event, through our sensory organs. So when you experience something, when you hear something, feel something, experience something, come in contact with something, with someone, or an event, that perception seeds your consciousness, has been embedded within you. Now the unfolding of your behavior happens. You have seven senses. You don't have five senses, you have seven senses. Of course you have sight and hearing and you know touch and smell and taste and so forth, but you also have a sense of balance. You wouldn't be able to sit up straight if you don't have a sense of balance. You also have a sense of time. So through your seven senses, you perceive, you hear, you touch, you feel, you smell, and so forth. You experience something, you're seated with your consciousness. We also have seven spiritual senses. You can see, that's a physical sense. You can see beyond the physical, clairvoyance. Someone can see a spirit walking around. That is spiritual sight. That's the clairvoyance, the spiritual sense. You can hear physically. Some people can hear spirits speaking, like their deceased grandmother speaking to them. That's clear audience, hearing beyond the physical. Some people, uh, ancestral spirit comes in the room and a certain smell takes over the space. Spiritually, that's clear aliens. They can smell beyond the physical. Some people have a sour taste or sweet taste when a certain energy moves through the room. That's clear gustance, tasting beyond the physical. You also have clear sentience. A spirit moves through the space and you can feel you know, a sense of hotness or coolness or whatever it is, that's clear sentience, feeling beyond the physical. There's also clear equilibrance. A spirit moves in the space, depending on the kind of spirit it is. It causes a sense of loss of balance and so forth or equilibration. You, you can sense equilibration or equilibrium beyond the physical, clear equilibrance. And then you can also lose your sense of time and certain spirits move through the space and so forth. That's clear timians. So, you have seven physical senses and their corollary, seven spiritual senses. This is how we experience things. So as soon as something happens, you come in contact with somebody, they speak to you, they give you something, you see something happening down the street, you're seated with that awareness. You're seated with that perception. That's the first phase in the unfolding of behavior. You've been seated. Now, what is the next phase? It is the germination and rooting. That's the black circle. 
once it germinates in roots, just like the roots go down deep and grab the soil, the nutrients and the water in the soil, once you have that perception, then there's something that stimulates deep within you, either the root energy of your being and your consciousness. So you have an experience and that stimulates certain thoughts and intentions that come from the root energy of your being that's pure and your consciousness, which is pure, or it only goes to a shallow depth, stops right here and hits your triggers, things you've been conditioned to believe that are false or foolish or self-destructive or triggers certain you know experiences you've had and then you respond based on that. Instead of going deep within your consciousness to hit the root energy of your being and your consciousness to have a proper understanding and analysis of what you just perceive, you get hit with triggers because you don't go deep enough and then you respond based on conditionings. But if we're operant functionally and harmoniously with who we are, we have an experience is seated within us. The next phase is we go deep within our consciousness, root energy of our being, and that stimulates certain thoughts and intentions that are either rooted in consciousness, pure consciousness and pure energy, or they're rooted in shallow pseudo consciousness and a you know a weak residual energy. So that's the next phase, the germinating or rooting. The third phase is the sprouting. That's the yellow shoots break through the surface of the soil. What is the first expression of what you experienced? An energetic reaction. So you have an experience that's a seed. It goes within you, germinates or roots within you, and it stimulates certain kinds of thoughts and intentions, either truthful thoughts and intentions based on reality or pseudo thoughts, intentions based on misinformation. And then you have an energy reaction. That's an emotional reaction. You can react with joy, you can react with anger, you can react with exhilaration, you can react with anxiety, you can react with confusion, you can react whatever that energetic expression is that the first manifestation of your thoughts that were stimulated by that experience. That's the first thing, thing that people see. They typically are not reading your thoughts, but when you have an energetic reaction, emotional reaction, that's the first sprouting or manifestation of what's in your thoughts. The next phase is the red circle, the full flowering, then you engage in action. Action based on those thoughts that were stimulated. So you act, you respond, you either engage the person, event, entity, you're doing something, whatever it is, you act based on that. That's the next phase of the behavior. That's the flowering. And then the final phase, the harvesting and seeding, is you um, adhere to and feel the consequences of your actions. You act, you project energy out, you engage an individual entity or event, it provokes them, and then there's a response. Everything that you engage in, when you project energy out and so forth, even physically, if you push somebody, there's a physical response. If you project energy out towards an individual or entity, there's gonna be some response at some point. So you're gonna suffer or simply experience the consequences of the projection you put out. You harvest what you cultivate. You reap what you sow and so forth. And then when you receive the fruits of your you know, consequences, then you take the seeds out of the fruit and you replant so you can start that process over just like you do agriculturally. The same thing happens with our awareness. So when we go through this cycle, seeding, germinating, rooting, um, sprouting, full flowering, and then harvesting, and then also seeding once again, or you perceive an issue or you come in contact with an issue and so forth, it roots itself within you, it starts stirring within you, 
and you generate certain thoughts and emotions, you know, or intentions associated with what you just experienced, then you have an emotional expression, which is the sprouting. Then you engage in action based on that emotional expression, which is rooted in your thoughts and intentions and so forth. And you act based on how you believe you need to, or, or you know you need to act. And then you experience the consequences of your actions. That's the harvesting of that result. So we go through that cycle every time you engage in any form of behavior, whether it's, you go through that cycle sometimes within a nanosecond, you go through that entire cycle, but anytime you engage in behavior, you have to go through that entire cycle. And these different phases of the cycle are governed by different divinities. You'll have the spring equinox that is governed by Kepra and Keprit. You have the autumn equinox governed by Atem and Atemet. You have the summer solstice governed by Shu and Tefnut, operating through Shemu and Shemut and so forth. You have the winter solstice governed by Alsar and Aset. And then you also have the balancing points as far as balance governed by Ma'an, Ma'at and so forth. Within the sprouting portion, that radiant force that causes the sprouts to come up, within that cycle, you have Ren Pet. When you're living in harmony with that energy of sprouting, just like, you know, when you're consuming foods that you need to consume that are in harmony with, you know, the vitamins and minerals and so forth that you need, then everything works fine. But if you, if you become deficient, then you're going to have a problem. If you become deficient or out of alignment with the divinity that governs the sprouting manifestation of the energy of your thoughts in a harmonious way, if you're out of harmony with Ren Pet, then your emotional expressions, your sprouting are going to be disjointed. Now, people are going to say this person is emotionally imbalanced. Why are they responding with an unusual expression of anger over something that happened at, you know, getting the, their order at a coffee shop wrong or something that their significant other said or something that happened with their children or at work, their place of employment or entrepreneurial or whatever? If you're out of harmony with Ren Pet, that energetic force that causes a natural harmonious shooting or sprouting, then you're gonna manifest disharmonious shooting or sprouting and you're gonna manifest emotional imbalance. But when we invoke the divinity, let's switch back over. When we invoke the divinity of Ren Pet, and this is Ren Pet, once again, Ren Pet, and you notice you have Ren Pet and Ma'at together. This is Ma'at and this is Ren Pet. Let me expand that a little bit for you. So, Just like you see the yellow circle, we said that's the balancing point, 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of darkness. The balancing point of the second balancing point of the year, the springtime, things are coming from the cold cycle to the warm cycle and crossing over and so forth, crossing that balancing point. Ma'at is governing that balancing point. She also governs the balancing point, the crossover from nighttime to daytime when the sun is rising and crossing the balancing point and so forth, Ma'at is in the solar boat of Ra and so forth, dealing with that rising of the sun in the solar boat. So she's in that yellow circle, but then Ren Pet is in that yellow circle of the sprouting as well. You want your sprouting or your emotional reactions to be guided by the female divinity of divine law and balance, which is Ma'at. So you have the force of balance in concert working with the force that governs the sprouting or the renewal or the resurrection. So 
how do we uh, regulate that? How do we regulate our emotional energy, our emotional expressions? And emotions, of course, are e external motions. So that's energy. That's an expression of our divine living energy and so forth. How do we regulate, regulate that? Second. And the reason why we show this specific image is because it's the key actually to balance a major key to balance within our communities. So just think about the principle there's a divine force that regulates balance on earth, the balancing of the planet, the balancing of the rivers and the mountains and oceans and everything else, your capacity to balance yourself. If you drunk something and got hit in the head and so forth and your sense of balance was thrown off, you wouldn't be able to sit up straight, you would fall over. The same force that allows you to balance yourself, the same force that balances the planet and the other planets, suns, moons, and stars, and so forth. On the feminine side, it's Ma'at. On the masculine side, it's the male divinity, Ma'a. So that same force of balance is directly working in concert with the force of sprouting or energetic expression. What will happen if all of the adults in the Afurakani, Afurakani community, the African Black community, invoked ma'at and invoked renpet on a daily basis through ritual invocation. When we pour libation in the morning, when we engage in ritual prayer and so forth, and we invoke them by name, when we engage in susu meditation and invoke these divinities, when we invoke them by name, renpet and ma'at, the sound vibrations project, provoke the energy of these spirits that govern significant aspect of creation and allows us to align our spirits with them and absorb their energy so we can balance ourselves. What happens when we invoke them on a consistent basis? Then our energetic expressions become balanced. Our emotional expressions, ren pet, our sprout, sprouting, becomes in harmony with divine order, ma'a, meaning law, the expression of order. What happens when we don't do that? Arguments between male and females, men and women in relationships, discord in relationships with children, discord in relationships with family, discord in relationships with friends, and discord in relationships with, you know, um, coworkers who are connected to you, discord in relationships or interactions with other people in our Afrakani Afrakani community, when mistakes are made, we have ritual mechanisms within our culture to address the mistakes and re, re, realign ourselves in a harmonious way. But if we don't adhere to those mechanisms, then it just turns into a war. This is why we have sound systems of uh, governance and jurisprudence. Let's look at that real quick. We mentioned that earlier. Um, let me put that up, pull that up. Okay, so in our in our book of Jiramayan and Fashe, that was one particular article that we were addressing the pair of Newt. But when we're talking about the definition of nation building, restoration rooted in our ancestral religious values. We talk about the seven principal values of nation building restoration. And these seven principal values of Amai Sesu, which is nation building restoration. In order to be a nation, you must establish methods of food production and preservation. Obviously, you can't have your enemy. Just think about our, our people who escaped from enslavement. 
went into places like the Dismal Swamp in Virginia, North Carolina, where they established an independent sovereign state that lasted for over a century and so forth, a couple of centuries, where they were building homes, growing their crops, raising children, grandchildren, leaving the sovereign space, going over to where the plantations were, raiding the plantations, freeing more enslaved people and bringing them back to the Dismal Swamp and so forth. Thousands of people living in this area, even when the Europeans would send you know, a militia into the swamp to drag our people back into enslavement. We had a militia established and we defeated them consistently to the point where they sought to enter into peace treaties with us. So they wouldn't come over here. They would say, well, we can't come over there even though we would still raid the plantations and free our people. But if you escape and establish your independent sovereign space, the first thing you have to do is feed yourself. You can't go back to the plantation and say, we're free. We have our own independent land. But you have to go back to your enemy to feed you. That's insane. So methods of food production and preservation. That's the first principal value of Amai Incessio Nation Building Restoration. Second, methods of curing disease. If someone gets sick on the land and so forth, you can't go back to your enemy to cure you. That's insane. Plus, we are the ones who have the medicinal understanding, the medicinal use of thousands of herbs and so forth. We brought that with us from the continent of Afuraka, Afuraka, and this is where the whole notion of alternative healing and homeopathic healing and so forth came from. But we established methods of curing disease. The third principal value of nation building restoration, establishment of a military structure we know that anytime we establish any independent sovereign space, whether it's land or a business or an organization, anything that we do that's independent, the whites and offspring are going to seek to destroy it. Like the cancerous cells that they are, they're going to seek to find something healthy and seek to consume and destroy. Cancerous cells move throughout the body seeking to consume and destroy healthy cells. That is their nature as cancerous cells. The only way they will stop doing that is when they are eradicated themselves. The whites and the offspring have been seeking to consume and destroy Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people, everywhere they have come in contact with us on earth for the past 12,000 plus years and they will not stop until they are eradicated because that is their nature. So we shouldn't be trying to teach them how not to be cancerous cells Imagine healthy cells trying to convince cancerous cells, hey, you, you know you're operating in the wrong way. You're being cellulist or racist. You need to stop being that way. And th these are cancerous cells. We need to recognize who's who and operate accordingly. So you must establish a military structure, just like your immune system and lymphatic system is the military structure in your body. So when you know disorder shows up, free radicals show up, the immune system and lymphatic system will kill them in order to preserve you. Without your, your immune system and lymphatic system, you don't have a system, period. The fourth principle value is the institutionalization of values, establishing training, educational, industrial, cultural, and religious institutions. We institutionalize our values through these institutions and so forth, so that we can continue to build our nation. Establishing sound systems of governance and jurisprudence. Now, this is where we get into this notion of ma'at and renpet. So if you have sound systems of governance and jurisprudence, you learn how to mitigate disputes without a minor dispute expanding into a great conflagration to the point where people are murdering each other in the nation and internal rot and fissure because we didn't have a governmental system in place that could mitigate disputes in a harmonious fashion. So when mistakes are made, you embrace the mechanism of culture. We have our own ancestrally grounded approaches to governance. We are the first people who establish representative government. So we, for example, in the Akan tradition, there are seven great ancestresses who are governed by seven great female abosom, seven goddesses. And those seven great ancestresses are the heads of the seven great matriclans in Akan culture. So all the 26 million plus Akan people 
and Ghana and Ivory Coast, as well as the millions of our kind people in the Western Hemisphere, all of us are descended from one of those seven women. So we're just we're part of one of those seven clans. If you can't trace your spirit genetic descent from one of those seven women, then you're not our kind. So those seven women govern seven, seven, seven great matric clans. Each one of those clans have a male and female head of the Asona matric clan and the Agona matric clan and the Adriana matric clan and Ekoana matric clan and Rieto matric clan and Asinie matric clan and Asachiri matric clan and so forth. Seven great matric clans, a male and female head of each matric clan and the male and female heads of the matric clan make up the governing tribunal for the Ohini, the king, and the Ohima, the queen mother. So when you have the head of your clan, the male and female head of your clan, um, sitting on the advisory panel for the king and the queen mother, the Ohini and Ohima, you have a direct blood clan relative representing your clan on the advisory panel for the sovereign and so forth. So you have a direct blood representative in government. So we've always had representative government. We are for the whites and offspring knew anything about that and so forth. They copied that from us. So we have a way to govern ourselves and you know govern business, economics, social issues, political and so forth, and also mitigating disputes. So when we talk about ma'at, divine law and balance, and then Ren Pet, the sprout, the manifestation, you know, energetic expression and so forth. When those work together, anytime there's any kind of conflict and so forth, it's addressed in a balanced way, Ma'at, when we invoke Ma'at ritually, and we invoke these deities before we have, you know, um, discussions and reach a consistent consensus with regard to law and so forth, we invoke the divinities. So their energy is present to help balance people out. So when we invoke them, we have a balanced approach to emotional expressions, and therefore the society can move along in a harmonious way, and it doesn't fall into internal internecine warfare. You can maintain a civilization for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Ancient Kemet was maintained <clears throat> for thousands of years. Other civilizations, they'll go, or the whites and offspring don't even have civilizations. They have societies, but they don't have civilizations. A civilization is a society rooted in the divine order of creation, which they don't have. So they have societies, but we have civilized societies of civilization, a social order rooted in the divine order of creation. So the whites and offspring have societies and they typically fall apart within a few hundred years or less. We've had civilizations that lasted thousands of years unbroken. Even if there are conflicts because of the mechanism of government and jurisprudence headed up and, you know, uh, led by Ma'at and Rempet, we can mitigate those disputes. Even if we have to, you know, set aside some land and move to these different areas and reestablish different regions and so forth, the new cities, but we're still part of a nation like Kemet that lasted for thousands of years. So... We can do the same thing. We have that model on the continent. We have that within our bones and blood. We have that when we establish these new settlements here in North America, when we escape from enslavement, those who maintained ancestral religious practices are the ones who established these various independent black towns. There were hundreds of independent black towns, some of them incorporated, some of them unincorporated, some of them still exist and so forth. We established independent black towns that lasted for over a century those who maintained ancestral religion, we engaged in that process, that age old process of invoking the divinities of law and you know, renewal and so forth in a balanced fashion. So we can do the same thing today. You can also do the same thing, of course, in your individual personal life, your interactions with individuals, family, friends, relationships, coworkers in your black owned business and so forth, Switch back. Oh, 
Hold on one second. Now, um, so when you look at this image, you'll see, of course, Ren Pet right there. Now, you see here, this is our certification. Um, when we talk about Ren Pet Chaut, the reason we have Ren Pet Chaut year, Ren Pet Chaut 20, and these are the Medut and Toro, the quote unquote hieroglyphs, but the Medut and Toro, the symbols that represent Ren Pet, and the two cattle holes are represent 10 and 10 together is 20 and so forth. But um, this is my 20th year of teaching Susu, which is the ancient term for meditation. Let me show you that real quick before we move forward, just so you get an understanding of what we're attuning to. Of course, if you have any questions, and you can post them in the chat room. Susu or meditation is one of the ritual means by which we invoke Rinpet, invoke Ma'at, balance our expression, energetic expression, emotional expression, and so forth. Now, so to give you an example of what we are referencing, this is one of the documents that we use when we introduce our course, our certification course. So we have a meditation instructor certification course where we certify you in the practice of SUSU and the teaching of SUSU. So you can utilize that certification as a credential to go out and teach in schools or after school programs, colleges, uh, elementary schools, um, as well as places of employment for when people are dealing with work productivity and they bring people out at a seminar when they have a number of different speakers and they'll bring people out, they'll pay you $100, $200, $300 to come out and do a 20 minute meditation session to show how meditation can enhance work productivity. Um, in various schools, they now employ meditation after the first bell in the morning as well as after lunch and so forth for a few minutes to enhance learning outcomes and keep the children focused. You go to human services organizations or you know, when people are dealing with therapy, uh, social services organizations, women's shelters, family shelters, when people are having group therapy and so forth and they know that meditation can help reduce anxiety and depression, get you back on focus. Other organizations that deal with holistic health or breastfeeding or assisting women with weight loss after having children and breastfeeding and so forth, and they bring you out for a holistic health seminar and teaching meditation. So there are different expressions where you can use that certification that we offer to employ yourself, you know, a few times a week going to different organizations and making $100, $200 per day teaching meditation at these different organizations. Um, some people do it full time, some people do it part time. But this is one of the documents that we open up with when we're teaching our course. If you look here, so the term susu is the ancient term for meditation in the Akan language. And we show in the Akan language, of course, susu means to measure, to take measure and so forth, to measure the depth of, calculate the capacity of, also to reflect upon, to meditate, to consider, to contemplate and so forth. But the root is to measure, but you're measuring the depth of the self, the structure of the spiritual self and so forth, contemplation and so forth. The root of the term su su is reduplicated su. When you look in ancient Kanid and Kemet, su, a measure of length. The same word meaning to measure Nakan, is also the term to measure nature command. When you look at the etymology of the word meditate, to ponder, think abstractly, engage in mental contemplation, from the Proto-Indo-European root med, what does the Proto-Indo-European root med mean? To take appropriate 
measures. Then we look at the word measure, the Proto-Indo-European root me means to measure. So whether med, the root of meditate means to measure, you're measuring yourself, measuring the depth of yourself, the capacity of yourself, the structure of your spirit and so forth. The notion of engaging in a form of ritual practice where you're measuring yourself, calculating the capacity of yourself, as we call it, susu in Akan, su in ancient Kemet, it has to do with measuring. This is why the White Snarl Spring said the word meditate is from the root med, meaning to take measure. And med means to measure. But even that is not a Proto Indo European root. It's actually, when they claim it's the Proto Indo European root meh, or med, that is stolen from meh in ancient Kemet, which is the cubit. What is the cubit? Meh, mm, a full measure, the ancient Egyptian royal cubit. The ancient Egyptian royal cubit, meh, nesu, that's this meh, nesu, and so forth, is the earliest attested standard measure. It is the central unit of measurement in ancient Kemet. So when you talk about measuring for roads and, you know, uh, buildings and temples and shrines and meru pyramids and so forth, the meh means to measure the unit of measure. This is the origin of the term med, which is the root of meditate, meaning to take measure. Meh itself meaning to measure, but engaging in susu is engaging in a process where you measure the depth of yourself, calculate the capacity of the self. So we teach susu. So when we go into a space and say, we're gonna teach this process of susu. They may have heard the word meditation and anything that they've attributed to that or heard about that is going to flood their awareness, but we take that away and say, well, we, what we're going to teach is susu, the ancient term for meditation. Now, what does susu mean? To measure the depth of the self, calculate the capacity of the self, to reflect, to contemplate, to take measure of the self. When you take measure of the self and you measure your thoughts, intentions, and actions against the standard of order, natural order, when they don't measure up, then you can make corrections so you can move forward harmoniously. So then we give them the proper definition. That's the only definition they have. Anything else that they learn from Hinduism, Buddhism, or white culture and so forth, that's moved out the way. Then we can focus on the introductory practice. So you can engage in a basic introductory practice, practice that can tangibly benefit the person to lower anxiety, depression, um, enhance learning outcomes for children, enhance productivity, at the workplace and so forth, enhance focus for people who are engaged in certain tasks and so forth, all these different things that are tangible benefits immediately apparent. This is why people are paying people to come out and engage this process. So, but let me just go back to the image that we had up. Um, So in the image, we talk about Ren P. Chow. This is my 20th year of teaching meditation. Uh, we started off teaching it through the Pata Satsum, which is one of our books. We go into Susu, meditation of what that actually is. This is actually an image from the first film. One time we filmed uh, the Pata Satsum, you know, workshop and so forth. That was this image is from our video, Patasa Satim video. You see it on the website. That was 18 years ago in 06 when we did the first filming. We were teaching it since 04, but in 06, we filmed it and put it on DVD. So this is an 18-year-old image and so forth, but we've been teaching this for the past 20 years. But this year, we decided in year 20, we decided to start the um, certification process. We were teaching it before where people just learn how to engage in susu themselves. But as far as teaching people so they can be instructors and they can go out and teach other individuals so we can send our people out to different parts of our community and transform our community from youth to adults wherever we exist in schools, places of business, shelters, you know, in the community and so forth. This is what we are working and aiming to do to reach all of our people, wherever we exist, 
youth all the way up to adults. So this is the certificate that we issue once people successfully complete the course. When they successfully complete it, you'll see that this is a certificate. Um, you know, the person's name will be there. They are achieved the title of Ocherefo. Ocherefo is the term for instructor in the Akan language and so forth. So they will be an Ocherefo of Susu, or as the full title will be Susu Cherefo in the Akan language. But, you know, in English, they will be an instructor of meditation and so forth. So our next course <clears throat> is beginning August 5th. We're just, um, we just completed one of the courses. Let me pull this up for you, actually. We just completed a course um, over a week ago, and we're in the midst of the second course we're teaching now that's gonna be complete on July, July 31st. And we'll have the people who will, be, will have, you know, received their certifications. Um, our next certification course, if you would like to be certified as an instructor, a meditation instructor. You'll see the flyer on the page, August 5th through August 26th. So you can join that course, um, go through that process. It's a four week course. Um, some of the 31 books that I've published, including one of them you'll see here, the Nkwamua Whole Life Journal. That's an important book because we have an Nkwamua whole life approach to conveying this information to our clients. So the way that we teach Susu and meditation, not only the cosmological foundation and the origin of it, we also dispel the notion that terms like yoga and chakra came from India, Sanskrit. We show that yoga came from the term yonk or yok, which was corrupted into yonk or yoke and yoka, but it comes from ank and eshkamet. Chakra or kakra comes from kara, kara, in ancient Kemet and so forth. So we show how they stole all that information, but that's one of the books we deal with. But the Nkwamua Whole Life Journal is a whole life approach to conveying this information in a culturally um, sound fashion. So when we go over a number of our books, the books that we go over um, are free downloads from our website. So it's a four week course, August 5th to August 26th. You can sign up for that. We have a split payment option if you'd like to make a deposit and then to, to register and reserve your space. And then next week or the week after, you can make, you know, pay the balance and so forth. We also have on the site a referral fee option where you can make $100 for every person that you refer to the course. So let's show you that right quick. And we recently did a, a live on this. And you see that video right here. So as a matter of fact, let me pull up the, uh, we'll pull up the image itself from that particular live that we did. Hold on a second. So we did this live like a little over a week ago. And what the process is, is basically when you refer the course to someone and you can do it in a couple of different ways. We were talking about the female divinity, Het Heru, and her form of Het Heru, Nkoso, or Nahoso, also Nahesit and so forth. But in the context of talking about that, we also talked about our referral offer for those who are subscribe to us either via Patreon or on YouTube or on Instagram and Twitter and so forth. But if you direct someone to the course, the course that's beginning on August 5th, once they register and pay the registration fee, 
then we will take $100 of that fee and transfer it to you. We'll go PayPal, you or Zoom, Zelle, you, Venmo, whatever, um, you know, platform you use and so forth. Way of saying it, I say we thank you to those who reach out to people on their list and so forth, the people you know. Of course, we don't know everybody you know, so you can reach people we don't know. So you tell them about the course, and all you really have to do is send them to the website. We have the, you know, the trailer, um, the flyers, and we also have a lot of videos where we go into detail, different aspects of Susu meditation, cosmology, and true story, and so forth. And they go to the site and they register. As soon as they register, you let them let us know that you referred that particular person. And once we once they register, then we will you send us your payment information. I will immediately send you the $100. If you refer one person, it's $100. If you refer two people, that's $200. If you refer 10 people and 10 people on your list, sign up for our course, then we'll send you $100 per person. We'll send you $1,000. As soon as they make their payment, we'll send you the payment. So that is a way for us to, you know, get people to register so they can become employed self-employment empower our community you employ yourself you make money for yourself whether it's part-time or full-time you're also impacting the community in a positive capacity so people can you know overcome anxiety overcome depression it helps with overcoming addictions and so forth and emotional imbalance and all kinds of benefits that we talk about with regard to susu so you impact the community in a positive capacity by being a susu cherifo or an instructor of meditation, but you also can become self-employed. Now, if you're not ready to take the course at this particular time in August, you can still refer the course and you can still receive $100 per referral. Even if you're not ready to take the course until September, if we do a course in September, we don't have one scheduled yet, we, we may do that in September. If we do, if you wanna wait for yourself for September, you can still refer people to the August course and you can still receive your referral fee from that. So. So that is the information that we wanted to share with everyone tonight. Just wanted to give you an overview and give you some insight into the nature of the divinity Ren Pet. Many people don't talk about very often when, you know, we typically follow very often, unfortunately, the whites in our offspring. So whoever they talk about when they're talking about our culture, whether it's Ra or Amin or, you know, Asar and so forth, whoever they talk about, we talk about. But we don't look into the culture ourselves and look at these male and female divinities and their value and their shrines within our bodies and their function and creation and how we can invoke them on a daily basis just by name, by including Ma'at and Renpet in ritual susu and meditation or ritual um, apai prayer or oshue and libation or whatever ritual practice you engage in just by invoking their names, that unique set of sound vibrations that make up the name Ma'at and Renpet and so forth. When you see that within your spirit, you begin to invoke their shrines, invoke them within the shrines in your body and so forth. And you begin to realign yourself and your energy complex with these divinities, the one that governs law and balance, the one that governs proper emotional expression and sprouting. And you'll see changes within your life and the way you interact with individuals who are connected to you right away and perpetually. So we need to know who these forces in creation are because they impact us whether we know who they are or not. You don't have to believe in any, you don't have to believe in the sun, it's impacting. You don't believe in the atmosphere, you're dependent on the atmosphere, you're dependent on the sun, you're dependent on the water and so forth. Doesn't matter if you believe in it or not. We don't deal with belief, we deal with actual forces in creation that we are subject to and that we have a relationship with. So, okay. So any questions on any of that information before we Log out. Okay. So yeah, so if you didn't see that, so the Rin Pet on the mundane level, 
question in the chat room. What is Rempet Chow? So Rempet on the mundane level means the year is, you know, the new sprouts and so forth. A renewal, a re beginning, it really has to do with the renewal, the returning of the plant life and so forth after the flood and commit the return. But the beginning is the, you know, beginning is actually the flood, the seeding time. But um, Ren Pet has to do with the, the year and Chaut is the term for 20. So Ren Pet Chaut is year 20. And it was referencing the fact that this is our 20th year, my 20th year of teaching Susu, including publishing in the Patas Asatim. And again, that's why we have this image. This that goes back to one of the videos on the site, the San Kofa Juma video, um, training video that we did. That that one is um, from 06, 18 years ago, but we were teaching in 04, two years before that. But that's the first time we filmed it. Um, so in year 20, we decided to, instead of simply teaching Susu and meditation how to do that we move forward with certifying people so they can be instructors to go forward and teach, impact our people, but also engage in self-employment as well. So, okay. All right. So I wanna say yet, I'll say we thank everybody for tuning in. If you have any questions on any of this information, of course, just hit us up on, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter as OGDAFO. Um, you can also, you know, email us, go to the SUSU page on our website. We have the contact link for our email as well. So once again, Yedase, we thank you for joining in. And Yebeshi Abio, we will meet again. That's it.